I have spoken in recent days to diocesan council, the deans, and the standing committee that it is my expressed hope that this year of 2011 will be free from constitutional and canonical challenges from the national leadership of the Episcopal Church and that we in the Diocese of South Carolina can get on with the work of growing our parishes, strengthening the lives of our parishioners and churches, and planting new congregations. I'm eager to, do, to be about this work of the gospel. A biblical metaphor I have employed from time to time is from the fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah, where the workmen are rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, laboring with a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. But as I have said, my hope is that this will be a season for the trowel. Time alone will tell if we will be permitted to do our work unencumbered by intrusions. I'm eager to see this diocese of South Carolina add daily to its number those being saved. And what better way to do this than by growing our existing congregations and planting new ones. This work, not the controversies of the day, will be the thrust of this address. When the word came to the apostle that a newly planted church was thriving in the town of Colossae, some hundred miles inland from Ephesus, he was in prison. Epaphras, one of Paul's converts, had spread the news of Jesus throughout the Lycus Valley of Asia Minor. Paul wrote to these recent believers to consolidate and establish this fellowship within the unity of the larger church therein recognizing the labors of his disciple. He wrote, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people, because of the hope which is kept safe for you in the heavenly places. You have heard about this before in the word of truth, the gospel which has arrived on your doorstep, just as in fact it's produced fruit and is growing in all the world as it has been among you from the day you heard it and came to know the grace of God in truth. This is an example of what the renowned Anglican missionary and missiologist Roland Allen described as the spontaneous expansion of the church. He suggested this was due mainly to the spontaneous activity of individuals. A newly found joy impelled these rescued men and women to propagate the gospel. Allen argued that the early church recognized this natural instinct of divine grace, gave free scope to it, and the apostles and leaders of the early church gave it their blessing. Another example is found in Acts chapter 11. In this case, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard of a congregation of Gentile believers taking root in Antioch, the third largest city in the Roman Empire, and propagated through everyday believers gossiping the gospel, they sent Barnabas, a Cyprian Jewish believer in Jesus, to assess this spontaneously growing congregation in Antioch. The scriptures say when Barnabas came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So similarly, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Colossae, having heard of this spontaneous expansion of the church, anointed it with his apostolic blessing. It was through such simple, grace-filled actions that new groups were brought into the unity of the church and into the fellowship. With, into fellowship with the apostles through the apostolic faith. I mention this because it is this faith and the dynamic movement and spontaneous expansion that is its fruit that we so sorely need today. I suppose I could say we are in need of revival or renewal, but that is not quite what I mean. Such language might carry certain connotations, especially for those of my generation who have witnessed the charismatic renewal, the growth of Crisio, Faith Alive, and other such movements which have yielded important and godly fruit within the Episcopal Church. 
but these have not stemmed the tide of cultural captivity, nor have they always brought what Roland Allen described as the spontaneous expansion of the church. They brought renewal for those within the church. Today, we need a centrifugal and centripetal force. Early Christianity was a movement of expansion. As such, it was not always tidy. If one desires safety and tidiness, it is richly here in our heritage as Episcopalians. But I'm reminded of a saying, the safest place for a ship is in the harbor, but that's not why ships are built. In the late 20th century, because of the explosive growth in the major cities around the world, missiologist Roger Greenwood, a missionary to both Sri Lanka and Mexico City, made the observation that he who wins the city wins the world. He who wins the city wins the world. It is even truer today. Winning cities for Christ is not done only or even primarily by making big churches bigger, though it certainly helps. Sometimes a city is won by adding more congregations. Charleston, for instance, is known as the Holy City, not because it has a huge mega church, but because it has many significant churches. What is astonishing to many outside of South Carolina is that there are seven Episcopal churches within a 15-minute walk of the Episcopal residence. Three of these congregations are among the larger Episcopal churches in the country, and three others are substantially larger than the median congregation of the Episcopal church. That is, St. Philip's, St. Michael's, and Grace are three of the largest churches in the Episcopal church today, within a 10-minute walk of one another. And then, Holy Communion, the cathedral, and St. Stephen's, within a short walk of one another, are larger than the average Episcopal church. There was clearly a vision among those who founded these congregations, not merely to make one church ever bigger, but to reach a new neighborhood and a new niche of people by starting another congregation. These parishes are made better by their proximity to one another. Well, maybe not always, but usually. Often a new congregation can invigorate an older one to begin to think, serious, think seriously about church planting is to, be, is to begin to reframe the opportunities, those opportunities that lie before us. Imagine the vitality that would be released if two of our congregations in the four deaneries which have the greatest unchurched demographics, Beaufort, West Charleston, Charleston and Georgetown planted two new congregations or satellites in the next five years. What new life would emerge within our communities within the diocese of South Carolina from eight new congregations or even twice that number? I believe this can be done even during a season of economic downturn. We often get fixated upon buildings and property but for many in our present culture, it's not the aesthetics of the building which attracts. Rather, it's the dynamism of the preaching, worship, and fellowship which wins the heart of the unchurched person. Certainly, we cannot leave entirely behind the, new, the need for property and buildings. A drab setting blesses no one's heart. But we can focus upon reaching the lost. And I believe the issues of property and building will emerge in many cases as quite secondary to the winning of the seeker and the transformation of his or her life in Jesus Christ. This change from building church plants to growing missional communities is a concept we need to embrace more fully. This will have the dynamism of a movement rather than the often stagnating effect of tending an institution. The diocese has, in recent years, held to the model of established parishes being the planters of new churches or new congregations. 
This has worked well in such places as the Cross Bluffton, where a satellite congregation was established at the Buck Walter campus. So also with Holy Cross, Sullivan's Island, and the planting of a satellite at Daniel Island, and their future plan of a third satellite congregation at Ion in Mount Pleasant. Such vision is inspiring. Others like St. Paul, Somerville, St. James, James Island, St. John's, John's Island, Christ Church, because of adjacent land, were able to build ministry centers, essentially planting congregations on the campus. There has been no lack of vision or creativity in this diocese. Today, two of our congregations in the Georgetown Deanery have begun initiatives as well. Trinity Myrtle Beach, under the leadership of Rob Sturdy and Ian Boyd, has initiated a church plant in the Carolina Forest community. This is making good progress. The Reverend Wilmot Merchant and the people of St. Stephen's North Myrtle Beach, with the help of the Congregational Development Committee, purchased property in the Loris area for a potential church plant in the future. They are presently making a strong witness for Christ by their volunteer work at Loris Elementary School, therein making a difference in children's lives. It will also work as a relational base from which to plant a congregation in the future. Nevertheless, elsewhere we have lagged behind, and others have seized the day. God will have his witnesses, with or without us. The future of two other initiatives is more complicated and raises the question of diocesan leadership in planting or acknowledging more complex cases. The well by the sea at Market Commons in the area between Surfside and Myrtle Beach is a congregation that has already outgrown its rented facilities and is at a crossroads. There are issues that need to be clarified and worked out and we are seeking to address these at both the deanery and diocesan levels. This is where the institution and the spontaneous movement need to work together to facilitate healthy growth. Likewise, the presence of St. Mark's Chapel in Port Royal raises questions which need answering. In both cases, the role of the bishop and the deanery come to play in how such initiatives are recognized. Then there is the question of how the bishop and the Congregational Development Committee assist church plants recruit ordained and lay persons who have a calling or vocation for such work. The establishment of St. John's Chapel on the east side of Charleston is one such diocesan plant and has included significant financial support from some of our larger parishes such as Church of the Cross, Bluffton, St. Michael's, Charleston, Holy Cross, Sullivan's Island, and St. Andrew's Mount Pleasant while it was still part of the diocese. Related to diocesan involvement in church planting, I remind you of something that you may have forgotten. The Protestant Episcopal Society for the Advancement of Christianity in South Carolina is the first society organized in the Episcopal Church for the extension of the gospel. Recently, it has reestablished itself and its prior and its priority for the financial support of church planters in the Diocese of South Carolina. You will find in your packet a brochure published by this oldest society in the Episcopal Church. In it describes its heritage, describes how you may become a member, and what the funds generated by this society will be used for. But first and foremost, we want to use it the funds, that is, for the planting of new churches in the Diocese of South Carolina. Your gifts and membership in this society will enable us to reconnect with the rich evangelistic heritage that is ours in this Diocese of South Carolina. Moving from fighting fires to detecting smoke. Too often, We wait until a house is in flames before we call for help. Just yesterday, there was a report from the Religious News Service which confirmed that we, what we all know, that mainline Protestant churches that have 
seen a fall in membership since the 1970s have continued their decline. Of course, the Episcopal Church is included in this declining membership. I do not reference this in order to berate us, but rather to alert us to the clear challenges we face in reaching our society for Jesus Christ. Even more to the point, I wish to stir us to positive action. In many cases, we are failing to effectively disciple and catechize our parishioners or reach the unchurched in our communities. Far too many congregations in the Episcopal Church are either at the tipping point or very near it. Recently, the church insurance company has revealed that every month more than three congregations close their doors for good. This alarming situation, they write, threatens the health and life of the Episcopal Church. The most recent statistics from the Episcopal Church shows 6,000 895 congregations domestically. The median size congregation has 160 members with a median average Sunday attendance of 66. That is down from 74 average Sunday attendance in 2002. This may not appear to you to be a big problem but I believe it is a dreadfully disconcerting trend. It is a challenge beyond just numerical decline. The present demographics in our church will have profound effect in the next decade, if not before. With the passing of the GI generation, those who fought World War II, well, there may be some present with us now, the aging of the silent generation, those connected with the Korean War, post-World War II, and the first of the baby boomer generation entering into their retirement years, those born between 1946 and 1964, we are looking at a dramatic decline in the next 10 years in financial resources in our smaller congregations and further dramatic decreases in average Sunday attendance. If you are a member of a small church, look around this next Sunday and ask yourself realistically, how many of these people will be here 10 years from now? Once the congregation can no longer afford a full-time priest, it becomes increasingly difficult to arrest the trajectory of decline. As one researcher has revealed, congregations with no clergy leadership either because they are searching for a new priest or because they cannot afford regular clergy leadership, are very unlikely to grow. This reality is making itself felt in congregations in the rural communities and smaller towns of our diocese, as well as among our African-American congregations, even within Charleston. Combined with this, the current economic recession has cut dramatically into the diocesan funds available for our Congregational Development Committee to assist struggling congregations. And frankly, this was not why the committee was created. The purpose of the committee was to enable parishes and missions which had a growth posture and an outreach focus to accomplish their God-given vision, not just to keep the doors open another year. But it is easy for such a purpose to devolve into merely assisting dependency. The straightforward truth is that I've had to say to several of our smaller congregations lately what St. Peter said to the lame man sitting at the gate called Beautiful in Jerusalem. Silver and gold have I none, (laughs) but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Well, this is the genesis of the upcoming deanery workshop for changing congregational DNA. We've entitled it The Future and Your Church. We will begin with a session entitled Reality Therapy. We need to face reality as it is, not as it was, nor as we wish it were, but as it is. We have a window of opportunity, and it is very narrow. We need to seize it. 
Therefore, on March 5th at St. David Shirah, we are holding a deanery-wide workshop for clergy and lay leaders in the Florence Deanery. This will not be a one-shot, fix-it-all workshop. It is the implementation of a process to nurture growth postures in our smaller congregations, especially in what I have referred to as cat, collie, and garden-sized parishes and missions. After we have taken this workshop to other parts of the diocese, we, we will return with take two in order to build on what we've done. Our plan is that the deanery clericus will be an ongoing support for the clergy in more isolated congregations. This marks an important shift or development for our Congregational Development Committee. We are not losing sight of our prior work of allotting money, but when we have less money, we will offer you what we have vision, teaching, encouragement, and a reminder of the dynamism that the gospel produces in the human heart for the glory of God. Median large congregations, gardens, houses, mansions, and ranches. I wish I had time to unpack those terms for you today, but some of you have heard me speak of the difference between a house and a mansion and a mansion and a ranch. If I had time to describe and address the opportunity and challenges before each of these different sized congregations, I would gladly do so. But this will have to wait for another day. These congregations, frankly, are the backbone of any diocese. And we have some of the finest examples of these congregations to be found anywhere in the Episcopal Church. For years as a parish priest, I sat in diocesan conventions and heard the unique or novel spoken of with excitement only to see it pass away in a few years. But the hard, steady work of shepherding and growing these size congregations and parishes often went unnoticed. If you are in a garden house, mansion, or ranch congregation that is moving forward with the gospel, you have my deepest respect. Your work is never done, and there is always more to do when you go to bed and when you wake up than there was yesterday. We have enough exemplary rectors of such congregations to hold in-house workshops in this diocese, just as we're doing for our smaller congregations with the Future and Your Church workshop. That will be another project for our Congregational Deve Development Committee. We can put hold, we can there's a typographical mistake here. <laughs> and since I typed it, I'm to blame. <laughs> we can hold diocesan workshops to further growth in every size congregation and man such workshops with many qualified and successful leaders from within our own diocese, so stay tuned. Stewardship. I turn now to a sensitive subject, money. It's sensitive because it touches that most sensitive nerve, the, run that, the one that runs from the human heart to the pocketbook. Recently, I was reading a bishop's address to his diocesan convention. He mentioned that parish giving to the diocese was somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.4%. He was concerned, and he should be. I came here to South Carolina from a diocese which had a percentage formula for assessments. The higher the parish income, the greater was the percentage of assessment. The parish I served was getting dangerously close to 25% of our annual disposable income. Thus, I have very little sympathy for 10%. As a priest in that diocese, I soon became an advocate of the 10-10 model, which South Carolina adopted back in the early 1990s. The model is biblical, clear, easily communicated at every level. Parishioners are asked to give 10% of their annual income to support the local parish. The parish is asked to give 10% of its annual income to support the diocese, and the diocese gives 10% of its income to the larger church. This has proven to be a tremendous means of financial expansion in the Diocese of South Carolina. And I will ask now that a chart be put 
over on the screen for you to look at briefly, hopefully. All right. Now, um, some of you are not able to see it, and you'll be grateful that you are not able to see it. <laughs> so for those who cannot see it, let me just read the first figure that's there, 1990. The disposable, estimated disposable income of the Diocese of South Carolina, all of its parishes, was $10,165,748. The actual turned out to be $9,604,855. The actual pledge of parishes to the diocese was $1,486,228, which produced an estimated pledge of 14.62%. It was at that time the diocese decided to move to the 10-10-10 model. It declined in 91 to 13%, 92 to 12%, 93 to 12%, 94 to 11%, and for one year and one year only, the parishes of the Diocese of South Carolina gave to the diocesan budget 10%. It then began to decline, 9 9.78, 9.26, 8.53, 8.52, 8.21, 7.82, 7.8, Well, that was the pledge. Let me get to the actual. No, I will spare you that. Now, even a cursory view of that. Now, if one looks at the other column, look at what has happened. And this is the brilliance of this move. If you look at the actual income during that time, why it's risen within the diocese of disposable income to $34,084,645. Well, let me summarize this. Even a cursory reading of this chart will show that while it has been a tremendous boost to total diocesan growth, it has not allowed for diocesan staffing or program to keep even a lagging pace. During these 20 years, total net diocesan budget income has increased by 350,000 percent. 300, excuse me, 350 percent. I was exaggerating there for a moment. <laughs> 350%. Well, that was the genius behind moving to the 1010. But giving to the diocesan budget during these same 20 years has increased only 40%, barely keeping pace with inflation. I'm compelled to thank our diocesan staff for getting by with less, especially during this time of economic recession, while continuing to expand the work we seek to accomplish. As our parishes have steadily declined in their giving to the diocesan budget, it has curtailed the initiatives that we might otherwise have pursued, particularly in assisting growing parishes and missions and in planting new congregations. The 101010 model is proving to be a study in steady decline on the parish to diocesan level, thereby hindering what the diocesan leadership, clergy and lay, can accomplish in expanding the mission and ministry of the church. This ebbing trajectory predates, and this is important, this ebbing trajectory predates not only the recent economic decline, which hit in the mid-2008, but it also predates the intense controversies of the Episcopal Church during the last seven years. It has nothing to do with either one of those. In stating this, I'm, I'm in no way suggesting that the main work of the gospel is done somewhere other than on the local level. What I am suggesting is that given our ecclesiology, the ministry and mission of the local congregation will eventually be thwarted by a diocese being hindered from providing what only a diocese can provide. 
Please know I'm grateful for every dollar that our parishes and missions contribute to the common work of our diocese. And some have given at real sacrifice to their congregational life. Others, I have granted a temporary exemption from giving until they can work out of a financial crisis. If you are in that role, please feel no guilt. But if not, you can feel a little. It's okay. <laughs> Others, uh, but I believe that the temptation to balance the parish budget by giving less to the diocese has proven to be less than helpful for our common life and, frankly, less than helpful to our congregations. The Diocesan Council and I have just reestablished the Diocesan Stewardship Committee. I have appointed the Reverend Jim Taylor as the chair. Our first two tasks will be restoring the original vision of the diocesan stewardship of the 101010 10, 10 model through teachings on biblical stewardship, and secondly, establishing a planned giving and a state planning task force in every deanery to be available to presentations within our parishes and missions. Turn now to Title IV Revisions and our constitutional concerns. Let me give just a brief account of developments regarding events and experiences since our reconvened convention on October 15th of last year. Several other dioceses have followed first, several other dioceses have followed our lead in expressing concerns with the Title IV revisions. These are Central Florida, Dallas, and Western Louisiana. Secondly, I have addressed some of our concerns with the province for bishops, and they have expressed their concerns with the stands and actions of South Carolina. In meeting with these bishops of our fourth province, I believe we have had an honest, forthright, and ultimately fruitful conversation. One outgrowth of this conversation is that the bishops of the province four will discuss some of the challenges facing the Episcopal Church regarding human sexuality before the next provincial gathering in June. I've been asked to, to be a part of presenting a paper on the relationship between human sexuality and salvation. Thirdly, I was invited by Bishop Nathan Baxter, Bishop of Central Pennsylvania, to speak at the recent clergy conference of the Diocese of his Central Pennsylvania on the challenges we face as a conserving diocese in the Episcopal Church. I was given the opportunity to speak of our ecclesiology and our approach to mission. Again, I believe this was a fruitful and worthy effort to converse with others within the Episcopal Church. Fourthly, I've received no official comment from the presiding bishop regarding our reconvened convention in October. Consequently, there remain significant differences for many of us here present with the direction of the Episcopal Church. But I believe we need to finish what we have set out to do at our convention in 2010, upholding the heritage and constitution of our church. I believe we have done a service to everyone in the Episcopal Church by pointing out the problems inherent in the title for revisions. Time alone what will, will de decide what will become of them. Finally, making biblical Anglicans for a global age. I believe we have made a godly witness by holding steadfast to our calling. Nowhere is this more significant than in our vision to help shape emerging Anglicanism in the 21st century. The fault lines that emerged in the Anglican communion with increasing clarity in 2003 have in the past month become starker than ever. The instruments of unity have proven inadequate to mend the net of Anglicanism. While the Episcopal Church has solidified its place within these instruments, the unity which the instruments were meant to hold has run like water through an open hand. Communication, let alone communion between many provinces, has all but ceased. 
Yet our diocesan vision of making biblical Anglicans for a global age grows more prophetic with each passing day. I am grateful for Bishop Michael Nazarelli's witness as our visiting bishop for Anglican communion relationships at this annual convention of the Diocese of South Carolina. His sermon last evening was deeply encouraging to me. His teaching yesterday and in our deaneries have been exemplary, spanning such diverse topics as Islam, multiculturalism, secularism, current developments in the Middle East, and within the Anglican Communion. Thank you, Bishop Michael and Valerie, for your presence with us. As a consequence of your visit, we are better equipped to help shape emerging Anglicanism in the 21st century. This could hardly be more relevant or timely. Last fall, while in Cairo at the invitation of Bishop Munir Anis to lead a retreat for the clergy of Egypt, the Horn of Africa, and North Africa, I was joined by Michael Clarkson and Chris Royer from our Anglican Communion Development Committee. While there, we initiated a companion relationship between our dioceses. Then the Reverend Imad Mikhail, principal of Alexandria School of Theology and a priest in the Diocese of Egypt, joined us for our clergy retreat in November and spoke of the challenges the church faces in a dominantly Islamic country. This January, one of the senior priests of South Carolina, the Reverend Rick Belzer and his wife Anne, went to Alexandria to teach at the Alexandrian School of Theology during Father Mikhail's sabbatical. Shortly after the Belzers arrived, dramatic events unfolded in this most pivotal and key country of the Middle East. We have received regular updates from the Belsers and Bishop Munir. Most recently, the bishop has written, our beloved country, Egypt, is going through a critical time which requires all of us to be united, working together in order to achieve freedom, democracy, and social equality, which are at the heart of the youth rebellion of 25 January 2011. Without achieving these goals, the revolution will have been mere words. Therefore, with strong hands, hopeful hearts, and with patience, we all need to work each in our own field until Egypt becomes a de developed de democratic country. Only then will Egypt regain its pioneering place in the Middle East, a position it has held over the centuries." End quote. We pray for them at this crucial and pivotal time in their country and give thanks to God that our prayers and efforts can play some modest role in the lives of these brothers and sisters in Christ. I encourage every congregation to include our brothers and sisters in the Diocese of Egypt in the prayers of the people on a regular basis. If only time permitted, I could speak of our diocesan ministries and relationships in other places around the Anglican Communion the Diocese of Kilmore, Elfin, and our dog in Ireland, the province of Tanzania, the province of Burundi, the Diocese of North Uganda, the Diocese of Yos in Nigeria, the Dominican Republic. This is to name but a few. I guess that's a suggestion I need to conclude. <laughs> the complete list is lengthier by far. I refer you to a map produced by the Diocesan Anglican Communion Development Committee, which shows the various parish, parish and diocesan relationships around the world. You may find this on our diocesan website. When Bob Lawrence, chairman of the Anglican Communion Development Committee, and Michael Clarkson joined me at the recent Communion Partners gathering in Orlando, Florida, we spoke of the work of this committee and our diocesan vision. Upon handing out copies of the map, Participants expressed astonishment that one diocese could foster such an extensive number of missional relationships around the world. Frankly, when I saw it, I too was astonished. There are so many dimensions of our diocesan life that I could mention. I have chosen only these four. First, the, the need to focus afresh on growing congregations 
and to plant new congregations, whether through spontaneous expansion, through parish-led initiatives, or diocesan ventures. Secondly, there is the need for addressing faithful stewardship with our parishioners, our congregations, and the diocese. Thirdly, I have touched briefly on matters dealing with the Episcopal Church, particularly our concerns with the Title IV revisions, and which we shall take up again today. Finally, I've reminded you of our vocation to help shape emerging Anglicanism by making biblical Anglicans for a global age. May God continue to guide and empower us to hold firmly to the truth and to venture out with the gospel. Amen.